According to the great stories of the Bible, King Solomon, son of David, ruled Israel 3,000 years ago. He was renowned for his wisdom, his women, and his astonishing wealth. King Solomon surpassed all the kings on the earth in wealth and wisdom. And when the rich, powerful, and exotic Queen of Sheba visited King Solomon, she brought him gifts from the mystical land of Ophir. And she came to Jerusalem with a very great train, with camels that bear spices and very much gold. But where was Ophir? Where had all that gold come from? Did it even exist? For thousands of years, ancient Greeks, Renaissance adventurers, Victorian explorers, and modern-day scientists have searched for the source of Solomon's gold, a mysterious place that would famously become known as King Solomon's Mines. This is the story of one man who really believed he had found them, and he did find something, but it was not what he expected. Carl Malk, the explorer who would become forever linked with the discovery of King Solomon's mines, was a man of humble origins. Malk was born in 1837 in Stetten, a small town in Germany. His father was a carpenter and later went to the army, and Malk had three siblings. So the family was uh, not very wealthy, and maybe one could even say that they were poor. But when he was a child, he received a gift that changed his life forever. For his 10th birthday present, he received a world atlas, which showed Africa as almost a total blank on the map. And this really inspired Malch to become an explorer, to fill in the gaps in the map of Africa. At first, Malch's interest had nothing to do with King Solomon. He was attracted by the mystery of Africa and the opportunity it presented for an ambitious young boy. Africa was a good destination for explorers because the interior of Africa was still unknown to Europeans and so there were still opportunities of heroism and adventure. As Mount grew older, his obsession with Africa continued. During this time, he avidly consumed virtually every book on the geography of Africa from the 16th century onwards, including the accounts in particular of the early Portuguese explorers. And one story leapt from the page to catch Malk's eye. In 1531, Vicente Pagado, a captain of a Portuguese garrison on the southern coast of Africa, wrote, among the gold mines of the inland plains between the Limpopo and Zambezi River, there is a fortress built of stones of marvelous size, and there appears to be no mortar joining them. Pegado and his Portuguese explorers were convinced that this fortress was the palace of the Queen of Sheba, and the gold mines were the source of King Solomon's wealth. The Bible tells us that King Solomon was the son of the great King David, who slew the giant Philistine warrior Goliath. How Solomon became celebrated for his wisdom, his women, and his fabulous wealth. But the Bible also describes Solomon's great meeting with the Queen of Sheba, who brought him tons of gold and spices from her land. She arrived at Jerusalem with a retinue of camels, laden with spices and other precious objects intended as gifts for Solomon. And she gave the king 120 talents of gold and of spices very great store and precious stones. There came no more such abundance of spices as these which the Queen of Sheba gave to King Solomon. This is the story we all remember, but in reality there is not a shred of evidence that Solomon or the Queen of Sheba ever existed or that any of this story was actually true. As early as we can uh, trace our sources, readers of the Bible have been fascinated by the question of where exactly Solomon's wealth comes from. In the first century, for example, the Jewish historian Josephus speculated that his wealth came from India. 
And ever since then, interpreters have been struggling to piece together the clues in the Bible to figure out its exact location. The Bible offers some intriguing clues about the source of Solomon's wealth. It tells us, for example, that Solomon had to dispatch ships in order to retrieve this wealth. Solomon's ships traveled to a place called Ophir and also mentioned a place called Tarshish. For the king had at sea the navy of Tarshish with the navy of Hiram. Once in three years, the navy of Tarshish bringing in gold and silver, ivory and apes and peacocks. No one knows the exact meaning of the words Ophir and Tarshish. Ophir is often associated with gold. Tarshish, some scholars believe, actually refers to a kind of ship meant for traveling long distances. The location of these places is unknown. But Mauk had discovered an important clue. Vincente Pagado, the Portuguese captain who described the fortress of marvelous size, was based in Sofala on the southern coast of Africa. The Europeans who were looking for Solomon's wealth were not usually reading the Hebrew Bible. They were usually reading the Greek or Latin translation of the Bible. And in the Greek translation of the Bible, the word Ophir actually has an S appearing at the beginning of the word, spelling Sophia. So when the Portuguese arrived on the coast of Africa at a port town called Sofala, they made a linguistic connection between the name of that port town and the Greek biblical word for Ophir or Sophia believing that to be evidence that they had found the source of Solomon's wealth. So could Sophila be Ophir? Mauk started digging for further evidence. And again, it was the Portuguese accounts that provided more clues. A Portuguese sailor by the name of Thomas Lopez arrived at the port town of Sophila in southern Africa in 1502. And there he was greeted by Muslims who told him of native sources that described something very curious. They described how ships belonging to Solomon would arrive once every three years and extract from a nearby town a tremendous amount of gold. And they went with the servants of Solomon to Ophir and took thence 450 talents of gold which they delivered to King Solomon. They had the right name. Sophila was Ophir, and they seemed to have found the gold. So if the Portuguese were right, they may have stumbled upon one of the most amazing finds ever. Malk was certain he had cracked it. King Solomon's wealth was in Southern Africa, and he was determined to find it. but he realized that he was woefully underqualified. So for the next 11 years, he devoted his entire life to getting ready for his Africa expedition. Every day he prepared himself both mentally and physically for the day when he would realize his dream. Mauch uh, was always good in school and he was interested in natural science and would have liked to go to university, but his parents lacked the financial means. To pay for his expedition, he trained as a teacher and became a private tutor in Austria. Mauch must have been really determined to go to Africa. In all these years, he didn't have support, he didn't have any money, but he still continued with his plans. He taught himself English, French and Arabic. He tried to acquire specialist knowledge through reading specialist books and magazines like Peter Mann's Geographical News. In his spare time, he studied Latin, medicine and astronomy. He visited the Botanical Garden and the Natural History Museum in Graz, where he was working at that time as a teacher. There, he gained some knowledge in botany, geology, and natural history. He built his own collections of minerals and insects. In 1863, Malk was convinced he was ready. So he wrote to August Petermann, the editor of Germany's highly respected geographical magazine. His aim was to sell himself as an explorer worth investing in. I believe intellectually, and considering my modest means, I have done all that could be done. But the body, too, requires preparation for such enterprises. By walking six miles or more each day, in every season, over any ground, 
often without any food or drink till my return to the point of departure, and always wearing the same warm clothes, I have tried to steal my body. Apart from this, I have not neglected gymnastics and musketry. In stature, I am tall and heavily built, and I am in excellent health. Considering these facts, I believe that I am capable of taking part in an expedition on these lines. Discover the past with exclusive ancient history documentaries and ad-free podcasts presented by world-renowned historians from History Hit. Watch them on your smart TV or on the go with your mobile device. Download the app now to explore everything from the wonders of Pompeii to the rebellion of Boudicca and the mysteries of prehistoric Scotland. Immerse yourself in the captivating stories of this remarkable era by signing up via the link in the description. Mauk's letter received an immediate reply from the magazine's editor. Peterman's response was uh, negative and rather discouraging. He uh, explained to Mao how difficult and strenuous such an exploration would be. But he proposed that if Mao should actually manage to get to Africa, he would consider um, publishing letters or reports. Despite Peterman's rejection, at the age of 26, after 11 years of preparation, Malk was ready to go. But uh, Malk decided to spend a few months researching in London before he actually went to South Africa. And uh, by the end of that time, he'd actually run out of money. Malk worked as a deckhand on a steamship to fund himself before arriving in Durban, South Africa in January 1865. His quest could now begin. With only the barest of necessities, a small pocket compass, hunting knife, blanket, painting equipment and handgun, Mauk set out to explore southern Africa in pursuit of the land of Ophir in June 1865. I have tried to acclimatize myself by walking diligently around the country, unconcerned if I roam across unknown countryside for two to three days without food, or even if I should have an unpleasant encounter with the largest carnivores. But Mauk soon ran into trouble. Mouth's travels were not at all straightforward. He went through a great deal of suffering, almost to the point of starvation. This was the fifth day of hunger for me, and it can be understood that I contemplated the future with a jaundiced view. Even small birds seem to fly away from me, while I am still miles away from them. No pheasant nor partridge was to be seen. And an hour-long effort to try to catch fish also failed. Hungry, thirsty, tired, with almost insupportable pain in my knee, I still had to cover 25 miles, and bad luck would have it that I didn't get a chance for a final shot, and thus did not get anything to eat. In desperation, Mauk sent a messenger with a letter to August Petermann, the editor of Germany's geographical magazine, to support his African expedition. This time his luck was in. Petermann appealed to his readers to support Mauk. We believed that he had to be helped. He is the only able explorer in the whole of South Africa at the moment. 
It would appear as a patriotic and scientific duty to support Herr Mauch and not leave him helpless in the far-off interior. Petermann's appeal uh, for support for Mauch and his magazine was successful. Several of his readers donated small sums. As Mauch didn't have any money himself, it was really helpful for him, but in comparison to other explorers, it was still a very small sum. However, these donations did help Mauch continue his exploration of Southern Africa for the next eight years. Two years into his journey, Malk entered the Tati region, an area located on the borders of Botswana and Zimbabwe. And with the help of the famous British hunter, Henry Hartley, Malk made his first significant discovery. On the 27th of July, 1867, Hartley brought me the news that, when following a wounded elephant, he passed several pits dug into quartz. I came to a site which I recognized as a smelting place. On examining some recent stones, I found gold. Highly pleased, I ran back to the camp to impart the good news. When Mauch discovered the first gold field, he was really delighted uh, that he had made such a big and great uh, discovery. The following day, Mauch discovered another gold field. Could these be the mines of King Solomon? Word of the gold mine spread like wildfire across the southern African plains, prompting one of its earliest gold rushes. As newspapers headlined his great discovery, Germany's geographical magazine believed Malk was onto something much bigger. Concerning the gold fields discovered by Malk, it is not improbable that they are identical with the Ophir of the Bible and with the places from which Solomon obtained his wealth in gold. But if finding gold mines was encouraging, for Mauk to be really sure that he was in the land of Ophir, he had to find the city worthy of the great Queen of Sheba. In the same year that Mauk discovered the gold fields of Tati, he began to hear rumors of an abandoned city with huge stone walls described by locals as fabulous buildings. Mauk was told that the city lay in the mountainous country between the two largest rivers in southern Africa, the Zambezi and the Limpopo. In May 1871, Malk wrote confidently to his country's geographical magazine to tell them he wanted to dedicate his next expedition to the newly united German people. I shall make it the highest duty in my profession to add honor to the name of the German nation. I expect that my next journey will offer such opportunity. The discovery of the ruins of Ophir would be a point which would be envied by other nations. For the next three years, Mauk searched for the ruins. He shot elephant and rabbit for food and suffered great hunger and exhaustion. Mauk tried to get to the ruins for a long period and often failed and had to come back to the European settlements. Mauk survived robberies and attempted to win the trust of local tribes. Throughout his travels, he had to form alliances with the tribal rulers. He feared the native people around him. He thought that uh, they might even kill him. 
and was at one time held prisoner in Matabili land until he came to an arrangement for his release. But eventually, local Karanga tribesmen brought him face to face with the magnificent walled city. Finally, on the 5th of September, 1871, I was lucky enough to be the first white man to set eyes on them. The ruins represent a mighty fortress, consisting of two parts, of which one on a mountain of about 400 feet with very large boulders, is separated by a narrow little valley from the second, which stands on a slight rise. Mel just couldn't believe his eyes. Nothing like it had been seen south of the equator, and it just shouldn't have been there. Malk was convinced that he had finally found the ruins of the Queen of Sheba's palace. But how could he be sure? Malk set about examining the structure of the ruins and found that the walls were built of stone without any mortar. This matched exactly with Vincente Pigado's 16th century description of the ruins he had read as a teenager. Among the gold mines of the inland plains between the Limpopo and Zambezi River, there is a fortress built of stones of marvelous size, and there appears to be no mortar joining them. Mauk's next step was to work out who had created it. He couldn't believe that such a structure could have been built by native Africans. Mauk's view was supported by the local tribesmen. I have learned from the local inhabitants that they themselves have lived here for only 40 years and that the region was quite uninhabited before that time. All are absolutely convinced that white people once inhabited the region, for even now, there are signs of habitations and iron tools which could not have been produced by blacks. So if the palace was built by white people, where did they come from? Mount turned to the Bible for clues. There is no description of Ophir in the Bible, but there is a description of the building of King Solomon's legendary temple. And the king commanded, and they brought great stones, costly stones, and huge stones to lay the foundation of the house. As he looked at the structures that comprised the Great Zimbabwe, he noticed a resemblance to the Temple of Solomon, as it's described in the Bible, and to other structures that archaeologists were only then beginning to learn about. Mount considered it likely that the palace was built by an ancient people called the Phoenicians. In the 1850s and 60s, archaeologists began to excavate colonies that the Phoenicians had established throughout the Mediterranean, and also sites in their homeland of Phoenicia, in what is now Lebanon. And this revealed to Europeans this complex, vast, far-reaching civilization that predated the Greeks and Romans, that had spread throughout the Mediterranean, and had an impact on culture reaching from the Middle East to North Africa. This really, really inspired the imagination of many Europeans who began to believe that the Phoenicians were capable of traveling great distances. 
The Phoenicians built their structures without mortar, and there was no mortar at this site. But this in itself wasn't proof. What else may there be to link it to the Phoenicians? Again, the Bible offered a clue. It made it clear that cedar wood was a critical ingredient at the time. And it was covered with cedar above upon the beams. Cedar was a wood famously found in modern day Lebanon. The obvious place to look for the wood was where it supported the stone structure. Mal didn't really have the materials or the manpower required for a major exploration of the site, but he did take some samples of the wood. I cut some splinters off the crossbeam over the northern entrance. The wood is still quite healthy, of reddish color. A comparison of it with the wood of my pencil shows great similarity, and therefore, I suppose, strengthened by further hypotheses, that it must be cedar wood. Convinced that the cedar trees didn't exist on the lower Zambezi, Malk was sure that it must have been brought there by Solomon's Phoenician builders from Lebanon. As the Bible says, Now therefore command thou that they hew me cedar trees out of Lebanon, Suddenly, it all came together for Malk. Here was a city that no African could have built. It was constructed by Phoenicians in the same style as King Solomon's temple in Jerusalem. The Phoenicians used stone without mortar and brought cedar wood from Lebanon to make the supporting beams. And the local name for Sophila is Sophia, like Ophir in the Bible. And to top it all, Malk had also discovered the two gold mines, the source of Solomon's wealth. So surely, this was it. I believe that I do not err when I suppose that the ruin on the mountain is an imitation of the Solomonic temple on Mount Moriah. The ruin on the plain, a copy of that palace in which the Queen of Sheba dwelt during her visit to Solomon. Besides, they conform best with the well-known Phoenician buildings. Natives and Arabs would have built differently. Even the fact that I could not find a trace of inscriptions anywhere appears to me to confirm the justification of my opinion. For nowhere do we read that Solomon had an inscription of any kind fixed to his temple. I believe Ophir is the present Sofla or Sofara, by which name it is known and pronounced in the interior. For Malk, there could be no doubt. Ophir was not in the Middle East. It was here in Southern Africa all the time. Malk's longtime supporter, August Peterman, still waiting for further details from Malk, quickly published a brief report on his great discovery. It is already known from newspaper reports that on the 5th of September, 1871, Karl Mauch discovered the magnificent ruins in the mountainous country between the Limpopo and the Zambezi, about 40 miles inland from Sofala, of which the old Portuguese reports tell, and which were connected with King Solomon's Ophir expeditions in early times. Mauk's great discovery made a huge impact around the world, and in particular inspired the great British novelist H. Ryder Haggard to write his famous book, King Solomon's Mines. H. Ryder Haggard's King Solomon's Mines was the most successful adventure novel of the 19th century. Haggard tells the tale of one man's quest into the heart of Africa to discover the legendary King Solomon's Mines. And he went on to tell me how he had found in the far interior a ruined city, which he believed to be the Ophir of the Bible. When suddenly he said to me, Lad, did you ever hear of the Suleiman Mountains up to the northwest of the Mushkalumbi country? 
I told him I never had. Ah, oh, well, he said, that is where Solomon really had his minds. Overnight, the book's title, King Solomon's Minds, a phrase no one had ever used before, entered into popular legend. And that novel was widely read by people in Europe, and it incited their curiosity and motivated other would-be explorers to travel to Africa in search of the gold and wealth that they believed they could find there. Ryder Haggard became one of the richest and most successful novelists ever, thanks to Mauck's discovery. The one person who got very little out of it, however, was Mauck himself. When Mauck came back to Germany, he hoped that he would be rewarded with a position at a natural history museum. But I think the lacking university degree and um, maybe even his personality uh, were aspects which uh, made it difficult for him. Impoverished and sick, Mauck was forced to take work in a cement factory. He suffered dreadfully from depression. He had a liver disease as a result of his African travels. His body was racked with pain continually. And uh, as his neighbor said, he was often drunk because his medicine didn't work anymore, so he was drinking alcohol instead. He spent his last days uh, in a hotel above a railway station near Stuttgart, sleeping on the third floor. Uh, he slept in an armchair next to an open window, and one night fell from the window. His neighbor found him just in the early morning and brought him to the hospital in Stuttgart. His spine was broken and both his legs were paralyzed. 37-year-old Karl Mauck died in hospital a few days later on the 4th of April, 1875. It is uncertain whether his death was accidental or self-inflicted. With his death, so died his reputation. His writings were largely ignored by the academic world. Mauch's discoveries went virtually unrecognized at the time. They were published in a mere 52 pages in August Peterman's journals. And if you couldn't read German, you would never have noticed them. And it wasn't until 1960 that his journals were actually published in full form. But at least thanks to Mauck, King Solomon's mines seem to have been discovered. And for many years, people believed that the ruin in Southern Africa was the site. But at the start of the 20th century, even this legacy was challenged. Now a new generation of explorers emerged, and they were very different. Gone were the days of romance and biblical literalism. This was a time for archaeology and science. Biblical archaeology really started in the mid-1800s when we had mostly uh, theologians, religious uh, figures, going out and trying to confirm people and places and events in the Bible. As time went on, these early geographers and theologians are replaced by professional archaeologists. One of these new professionals was British-born David Randall McIver, famous for his scientific approach to archaeology. In 1905, 3,000 years after King Solomon's reign, Randall McIver made seven carefully detailed examinations of Karl Mauck's Ophir. <laughs> The first thing he did was to date the buildings. By examining the pottery unearthed in the dig, he was able to tell when they were made. And Randall McIver quickly learned something revealing. 
They are unquestionably African in every detail and belong to a period which is fixed by foreign imports as, in general, medieval. In other words, one of the key foundations of Mao's Ophir theory was wrong. David Randall MacIver was the first person to identify a medieval date. And dating was really important because the, all of the foreign origins thesis are going right back to Karl Marx and his sort of biblical uh, interpretation depended on Great Zimbabwe being a lot older than it was, thousands of years older. The Great Zimbabwe ruins were not built by an ancient and vanished white civilization as was currently believed, but were of purely African origin and that they dated from about the 14th century. A second of his key findings would also be challenged. Malk was convinced that the structures had been built by Phoenicians with wood and stone brought from Lebanon. Randall McIver assessed and dismissed his interpretations as incredulous and found no such evidence whatsoever. David Randall McIver said, look, everything I've found here is identical to local African materials, remains, and so on. And he just said, well, that clearly means it must be African. There is no sort of layer underneath. The style of the buildings cannot be proved to owe anything to foreign influences. All characteristics of Oriental and European architecture are entirely absent. Following in Randall McIver's footsteps, the formidable British archaeologist Gertrude Caton Thompson led the first all-female excavation of the ruins in 1929 and made the next assault on Mauck's theory of Ophir. Gertrude Catton Thompson was sent over by the British Association in order to kind of provide a final answer. Caton Thompson dug deeper in scale than anybody else before her. She sunk six trenches into the ground around the main buildings and excavated in areas undisturbed by previous visitors. When she had finished dating the site, she declared, Examination of all the existing evidence gathered from every quarter still can produce not one single item that is not in accordance with the claim of a medieval date. If by indigenous we mean an origin born of the country on which they stand, then the ruins are, in my opinion, indigenous in a full sense of the term. In the early days of archaeology, claims by amateurs, by explorers, could stand for decades before somebody would actually come in and test what they had said and either prove or disprove. So it was a matter of 30 or 40 years before the archaeologist came in and really started excavating and said, yes, this is connected with King Solomon's Mines, or no, it isn't. And in the case of that city, the answer was, no, it's not. Your claim is, is wrong. So everything Malk had said about the ruins was wrong even down to the piece of wood he had taken from one of the supporting beams. It had not come from the cedar trees in Lebanon, but was in fact a local African sandalwood. Malk's scientific techniques were much more primitive than those used today. So for example, to identify the wood that was used in the structures he found at the Great Zimbabwe, he didn't rely on some elaborate chemical analysis. Instead, he simply looked at the wood and compared it to the wood he was using in his own pencil. And of course, there was another factor. Malk was a product of the Victorian age, which had very different views on black Africa. Malk was convinced that Great Zimbabwe must have been built by white builders, and the idea that it could have been built by an African people didn't come to his mind, which goes along with the um, European thinking at that time that the African indigenous population was a naturalistic, uncivilized people without a history and without a civilized culture. So believing that Great Zimbabwe might have been built by an African people would have meant a contradiction to this firmly established view. So does all this mean that Karl Mauck's quest turned out to be worthless? In a strange sort of way, no. Because while Mauck's conclusions were ridiculed, his discovery of the ancient city in 1871 has turned out to be one of the most important archaeological finds in all of Africa.
Known today as Great Zimbabwe or Great House of Stones, these ancient ruins have become one of Africa's most prized national monuments and a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Great Zimbabwe is representative of African achievement, brilliant African achievement in the medieval period. Archaeological evidence suggests that Great Zimbabwe was built between the 12th and 15th centuries by ancestors of the Shona people who had settled in the region nearly a thousand years before and who still inhabit Zimbabwe today. From a peasant village, it grew into a very prosperous political and commercial kingdom from 1150 to 1450, with a population of more than 10,000. Its development and growth was centered on agriculture, mainly cattle, and its massive gold and ivory trade went as far as Arabia and China. They found Ming pottery there, they found Arabic pottery there, Indian beads and so on. So clearly it was part of a, a much larger trade system. And to conjure up that kind of trade position it, and to be able to build such a large site and so such a sophisticated site, it must have been controlling all sorts of agricultural resources. No one is certain why Great Zimbabwe went into decline and was left abandoned in the 15th century, but many suspect it was due to the collapse of trade, political instability and famine. Now the whole world can recognize that Great Zimbabwe is a fantastic place, an amazing achievement. Uh, you know, structurally it's, it's an amazing, a beautiful place, beautifully built and so on. But also it's representative of a very sophisticated African culture taking place. Its significance is probably, you know, in its shortest, summed up by the fact that it, the name of the country derives from it. There are not many countries that derive their name from an archaeological site, and it's well deserved. If Karl Malk had realized this at the time of his discovery in 1871, he really could have changed the way the world viewed African civilizations. But of course there is another question. Does all this mean that the story of King Solomon's mines is simply a legend with no real basis in history at all? The Bible doesn't actually mention King Solomon's mines. It mentions the wealth of Solomon along with wisdom and women, the three W's. But it doesn't say where his wealth actually came from. So it's all made up by H. Ryder Haggard in his novel, King Solomon's Mind. And as archeologists, we can't be driven by a novel written in the last hundred years <laughs> to, to, uh, to uh, dictate what we're looking for. In the hundred years after Malk's death, nothing was found to substantiate the belief that King Solomon or his great wealth ever existed. But recently, little by little, modern scientific archaeologists are finding some evidence. And one of the most exciting discoveries of recent times was the evidence of Solomon's father's existence, King David. In the early 1990s, 93, 94, there was an inscription found at a site in the north of Israel, Tel Dan. It was from an ancient inscription dating to about the middle of the 9th century BC. The inscribed stone contained the letters Beit David and are identical to the Hebrew and early Aramaic words for House of David. And these words are believed by many archaeologists to be an authentic reference to the Bible. It said that a king from the house of David had done such and such, Beit David, the house of David. And that's the first mention of either David or the house of David that's ever been found. If we were talking in, say, even the late 1980s, I would have said that there is no evidence whatsoever for either David and Solomon outside the Bible. When the inscription at Tel Dan was found, then that put the debate to rest. It was clear that David did exist. And I really do think it's just a matter of time before there is something attesting to the reign of Solomon. 
and that time may not be too far away. In an arid region in modern-day Jordan, south of the Dead Sea, archaeologists believe they may have found mines created around the time of King Solomon in 1000 BC. We found hundreds of ancient mines. Uh, we found metal production sites. And we decided, just based on the surface remains, that we would start to do an intensive excavation at one of these sites, Khirbat al-Nahas, which in Arabic means the ruins of copper. Assuming that King Solomon did have mines, one of the things we have to ask is, what kind of mines are they? Are they gold mines? Are they copper mines? I would actually argue they're more likely to be copper mines than that he's making his money from the buying and selling of copper. Copper may not be gold, but during the Bronze Age, it was an essential element in the manufacture of tools and weapons, so it was incredibly valuable. What we discovered was that at Khirbat and Nahas, there were two major centuries of copper production on an industrial scale, and that was in the 10th century BC and the 9th century BC. That is the time of Solomon. So some have been wondering whether we've got King Solomon's mines here. We haven't found Solomon's mines, but I think our results put the issue of Solomon's mines, or let's say the Solomonic kingdom and its reach back on the table. So far, the ancient Greeks, Renaissance adventurers, and Victorian explorers have all tried and failed to find King Solomon's mines. Now the search continues into the 21st century, and maybe the archaeologists in Jordan will discover the source of Solomon's great wealth. Only time will tell. But of course, even if they do, there is so far nothing to suggest his wealth has anything to do with someone called the Queen of Sheba. The evidence for her remains entirely elusive.